everyone uh, for the next in our Distinguished Speakers series. Uh, today, we have two speakers, and so uh, that means there'll be two introductions. Uh, the first speaker is Chris Hopwood. Chris received his PhD from Texas A&M and has worked as a professor at Michigan State University and is currently an associate professor of psychology at UC Davis. Um, he does research on personality assessment, personality disorders, and interpersonal processes. He has an H index, for those of you uh, in the academic world, of 42, uh, which is uh, really impressive. Uh, he has won numerous awards, including the International Society for Study of Personality Disorders Young Investigator Award, the Society for Personality Assessment Early Career Award, and the North American Society for Scientific Study of Personality Disorders Mid-Career Award. He is also an associate editor at JPSB, which is the flagship journal in his field, one of his fields. And he's also an associate editor um, for the Journal of Personality Disorders. Uh, beyond that, Chris is also on the board for the Society for Personality Assessment and the North American Society for the Study of Personality Disorders. And he has won numerous grants from uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. I didn't total it up but it seemed like it was well over half a million dollars in grant funding and maybe even selling it short. So um, it is really an honor to have Chris here today to speak to us about being real and please join me in welcoming Chris Hopwood. Thanks Ryan for that uh, long and slightly embarrassing introduction <laughs> and uh, thank you all for having me. We've really had a good time in Tulsa since we've been here uh, Wednesday. Uh, we went to lunch with the gentleman whose name is on the outside of the building is sitting in the middle of the room and I asked him what's the difference between effective leaders and ineffective leaders and he said well there's six things but the first one and most important has something to do with integrity, being a person that the staff will trust. And of course you all have, have probably heard this uh, before. And that's sort of what I'm hoping to talk to you about today. Um, I got into this, uh, this line of work through clinical psychology when I was trying to train my supervisees who were often first-time uh, clinicians working with experienced patients. Um, and it was easy to teach them techniques, but the idea of being a whole, genuine, real human being seemed to be the challenge. And it was very difficult. It's sort of an ineffable thing to try to teach somebody to do. I guess that's why you guys focus on selecting those kinds of people rather than training. But my job was to teach them. And when you go into the literature, people like Carl Rogers, of course, talked about this quality in people. And this quote really captures what we were trying to do. In my relationships, I found that it doesn't help in the long run to act as though that I'm something that I'm not. And the key there is in the long run, because implicit in that little clause is that in the short run, it's not always such an advantageous or desirable thing to be real. And so that's what we're using realness for, to sort of distinguish it from the more general concept of authenticity. A number of people have tried to study authenticity. Uh, Kernis and Goldman, Wood et al., and you can see these, these bullets are the scales on their instruments. There's also people who've tried to study it from a relational perspective, so within a particular romantic or therapeutic relationship, what are the features of authenticity? And all of these different models have these different parts of a process. The idea is that first you, you have to sort of be aware of something that's happening inside of yourself, and then you ought to be able to sort of perceive that in a way that's relatively accurately, and then you ought to be able to do that thing, so take what's inside and put it outside, and you ought to be able to figure out when it's a good idea to do that and when it's not a good idea to do that. Well, I think it's very difficult to measure these kinds of interpersonal processes with, with a questionnaire, um, but this is kind of a model of, of all those different processes. So people have tried to study this concept as a sort of transrelational trait or within different relationship processes, and they focused on sort of insight and awareness and accurate perception on the one hand and how you behave on the other. And realness, the way we're thinking about it, is just part of this picture. And the part that we wanted to focus on is something that's not well captured in the existing measures that I just described for you. So if you give those questionnaires along with other questionnaires to people, what you find is that authenticity relates positively to well-being, to social functioning, to effective psychotherapy outcomes, to the more positive pulls of the big five variables, and that authenticity in particular moments relates to how authentic people are as a, as a general trait. 
And the problem with that is that is captured by that clause in the Rogers quote, that there are times when being real is not necessarily going to be advantageous or socially desirable right in that moment. And that's what we felt was really missing from a lot of existing measures. So there are examples of people like Machiavelli or Kissinger who used being something other than real to their political advantage. So Journer Truth and Galileo withheld something that they knew on purpose for some kind of pro-social cause. In more contemporary times, Tamara Burke and Colin Kaepernick are doing things that are uncomfortable, awkward, they're having personal consequences for themselves by being real. So there's these times when being real can have negative consequences or when not being real can have positive consequences. And that's what we were trying to capture, in part because I think that's what the students were struggling with, right? They, feel, they felt like if I expose too much of myself, the patient's gonna hate me and walk out, my supervisor's gonna see that on video, better to just be safe and not do anything at all, which I would imagine also doesn't make for a great leader. Okay, so what we wanted to do is to isolate the part of this model that's more on the external behavior side, that is, to what degree are you behaving on the outside, the way that you feel on the inside, which is trait general, not specific to one particular relationship like psychotherapy or romantic relationships, and which is adaptive in general. It's a good thing in general to be real, but not necessarily agreeable or nice or friendly all the time. So the first step was to uh, gather data on existing authenticity measures. We chose three of them that are common in the literature, the authenticity and relationship scale, the real relationships inventory, and the authenticity uh, inventory. And uh, we did a factor analysis of their scales, and we found two factors. So even though each one of them have more than two scales, their scales together seem to combine into two components the more interpersonal component and the more intrapersonal component. So these are pattern coefficients from that, that analysis. And, and the way to sort of figure out what these things are measuring maybe is in their, val in, in their validity coefficients, which are here. And I apologize if you can't see all of these. Um, the top of this table depicts the uh, variables with which, for which both of those components have similar correlation. So either kind of authenticity based on these measures is correlated with a higher internal locus control, being more extroverted, more open, more conscientious, and less attachment avoidant. And then this uh, set of variables is more strongly correlated with more intrapersonal components of authenticity. So that part of being aware of what you're like and being fairly unbiased and sort of going inside of yourself and figuring out what you want or what, you, uh, what you're like. So mostly it's affective disruption. So neuroticism, borderline personality, depression, interpersonal distress, alexithymia, anxiety. That's what the intrapersonal parts of authenticity measures seems to be sort of tapping. The interpersonal parts are related specifically to agreeableness, to not, being, uh, not like being told what to do uh, all that much, and to not, li not liking it when people are cold or unfriendly to you. So we're getting a pretty clear distinction between more intrapersonal validators here and more interpersonal validators. What bothered us a little was that this 0.4 correlation with agreeableness. When I think of someone who's keeping it real, I don't think first this is an agreeable, friendly, nice person. I think of somebody who's willing to be disagreeable if the situation calls for it. Um, and so that's the part that we wanted to try to exploit um, in creating um, a measure. So I already told you most of this. We wanted to take out of those instruments or by supplementing with new items the part of realness that wasn't so agreeable, which was trait general and which was more behavioral than internal. And we wanted to include cognitive, affective, motivational, and behavioral item content. So uh, we took all of the items that loaded on the general factor uh, um, of the measures that I just described, and we took out all the redundant items that left us with 77 items. And then three of us coded them as either falling in the more intrapersonal, the more interpersonal, or an ambiguous, can't quite tell kind of category. And our agreement was fairly good, a cap was 0.7. And so we retained the 31 items that we all agreed were more interpersonal than otherwise. And then we reworded them here and there to, to make them trait general, to simplify them, make, make them uh, good items, basically. Then we administered these items to 1,000 or so undergrads. We also had a two-week retest study, and we asked the participants to nominate informants to get informant report. Um, and we gave the 31 items along with some validators. And here are the items uh, that we ended up with. Hopefully, you can see those. As you can see, all of them have to do with doing on the outside what you'd like to be on the inside, but most of them have contingencies. 
So it's like I'm authentic even though there's a potential negative consequence for myself or for others. The R's indicate reverse keying, the reading level is in the middle column there, and then the part full correlation on the right. So for example, um, I tell the truth even if it makes people unhappy. I say what I believe even if people might not like that. I express my needs and desires directly. So that's kind of the flavor of the items that we're going for, and that distinguished them from some of the items on the other measures, which were a little bit more sort of positive valency. It's like, if I ask you, are you, are you an authentic person? You say, yeah, of course I'm an authentic person, which is easy to do most of the time. It's those moments when it's risky, that's the real test of whether you're authentic, right? Is whether you can do it when there's a cost. And so that's what we were trying to get after. The retest correlation was okay, 0.44. And the self-other agreement was uh, lower than we might have expected, about 0.16. And I've got some thoughts about why that might have been the case. Um, we gave the big five variables to both the cells and the informant to, to rate the target on. Um, and what we're finding is sort of what we hope, that uh, according to both self and informant, our realness scale was correlating negatively with neuroticism, positively with extroversion, positively with openness and conscientiousness, but less with agreeableness than we had found with those previous measures or, or than you generally find um, in research on authenticity. So, so far, so good. These are correlations between self-reported realness and both self and informant reported validating measures. So it's correlating positively with hexaco honesty, negatively with detachment, manipulativeness, and submissiveness. What gets interesting is down here in the interpersonal variable. And what this pattern at the bottom sort of reflects is if I ask you if you're a real person and you say yes, you're also going to say and I'm an agentic, assertive, dominant, extroverted person. But if I ask your friend if you're a real person, what they're going to say about you is you're a communal, warm, caring person, so, and, which may explain that self-informant discrepancy that uh, we think that we're being assertive and dominant by being real, whereas our friends think, well, that's actually a gesture of kindness and care. You wouldn't be that way with me unless we had an authentic, real relationship with one another. So we think that might explain some of the discrepancy between the self um, and informant perspective on the construct. We then, just to make sure that we hadn't gotten too far astray, administered our items again in 500 or so MTurkers with five existing uh, measures of authenticity. Here's a CFA model in which you take a method factor out to reflect the reverse keyed items. Uh, the model fit the data fine. All of the items still loaded on the primary uh, dimension, which is what you're sort of hoping for. Um, and here are the correlations with those existing uh, measures. Three of them were from the original study and then two others that are in the literature. All of them were fine. So uh, we're still sort of capturing part of authenticity the way it's been conceptualized in other research, but hopefully carving out this part that we're most interested in. We then did a couple of studies in undergrad and MTurkers um, to, to sort of replicate the big five measures and to see how these uh, constructs were correlating with values. Pretty similar pattern as before, negative correlation with neuroticism, positive with extroversion, openness, and conscientiousness, mildly positive with agreeableness, ranging from zero to about 0.15 or so. And again, when you ask the person, what are your values, if you're more real, you're going to say, I value agency. I value getting ahead, being dominant, being strong. We don't have informant data, but we would suspect, based on the, stu the third, uh, st results from the third study, that maybe you get the opposite pattern if we ask informants. We're collecting informant data now to test that. In the final study, we took um, a speed dating sample. So uh, this was 12 men and 12 women um, who all got together and were asked to have five minute interactions with each other and then would like get up and switch. And they were all vid uh, video recorded. These are data from Eli Finkel and Paul Eastwick. And there was eight of those sessions. So eight sessions with 24 people each. We then had eight coders with fairly limited training, we just sort of said what we were after, had them look at the construct. They rated every single interaction for both people, but those weren't the data that we kept. We had them watch one person interact 12 times and then fill out our items for realness, and those are the data that we were interested in. Um, for every, inter every individual, there was four coders, two men and two women, and they were randomized uh, to, to uh, watch different uh, people. The bottom line is that they agree about uh, realness. So there was a fairly strong agreement among our coders about which people were more real and which people were less real. Their codes in the end didn't correlate with the participants' self-reported traits, which is not a huge surprise because we're crossing methods. 
because uh, it's a very strong situation, right? So um, one question we have, and we haven't looked at this yet, is whether or not it will correlate with success. So like, did people that were more real get more dates or what? Um, there were some interesting findings or, or sort of um, occurrences in this study, like the time that our, our coder came to a lab meeting and said, you know, I thought this guy was really real, but in the first scene, he's like, the other person was from Portugal and was like, Portugal's my favorite country, I go there every summer, it's the, like the best place in the world. And the next person was from Greece, and he's like, Greece is my favorite country, I go there every summer. So it's an interesting kind of thing when you see them across 12 people in this strong situation. It's a fairly good test of realness, but the individual who really needs to make a decision uh, is, doesn't necessarily have access to all the right data. Um, so we've got a, a study going on right now that we haven't started collecting da data for. We're just finishing up the IRD. And the, and the goal is really to further distinguish realness from valence, because I think the basic problem with it, e even though we have items that try to saturate, that are, that are saturated with, you know, I do this even though there's consequences, it's a fundamentally challenging thing to ask by self-report. Um, uh, so we also wanted to see whether the informants uh, really do think of people who are real as, as higher and sort of warmth and communion, et cetera. And the last thing we want to do is get past the sort of global traits and get more into personality facets. And so we're using a peer nomination design where we're asking people, pick two people, both of whom you're relatively similarly close to, both of whom you like more or less equally, one who's more real and one who's more the opposite, which we're calling flexible. And we've got a paragraph to describe each of these people that is uh, equivalent in terms of likability. To see, and then we're gonna ask them rate their uh, values and traits afterwards to see what are the specific ways, controlling for how much you like the person, what are the specific ways in which people perceive real others as different from whatever the opposite of that would be. I think maybe I'll stop there. I've got another couple thoughts, but I think maybe I wanna open it up for questions and just leave you with Uncle Carl here. I, have to, I, should, I should preface this, we have time for Q&A, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I should preface this by saying, you know, I come at this from a clinical and, and to some degree personality perspective, but as I was preparing this talk, the reason I chose this talk for this group is because I would gather that this is something that you guys think about all the time, that people in various occupational settings need to have this quality. And I know that you have instruments that measure this quality as well, so I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about it from that perspective. Or I also brought cards. <laughs> yes. I wish to reveal my own profile. Yeah. Uh, his perspective sounds negative correlation with neuropathy. Yeah. Is there not a, a hypothesis to be made that someone who's emotionally unstable is more generous? Because they're impulsive and they don't think through what they're going to do, and so they just kind of do it. Yeah. It's an interesting and question. That's emotionally transparent. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, because they're so anxious that they can't hide it. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, could be, I think, that kind of person's going to think so hard that they're going to have a hard time being real, in the way, at least in the way Rogers thought of it, which is like, I'm going to sort of figure out what's going on and then reveal it on the outside. More back to the operational definition. It, it, it is, but it's a, it's a basic challenge with this topic because we try to eliminate the insight, like internal parts of the construct in order to make what we felt was a more tractable behavioral measure. But in some sense, th that part's a necessary, insufficient but necessary condition to be real in the way that humanists have talked about it. So you could push harder and say like, well, would a person say high in autistic traits be real because they don't have much in the way, much blocking them from doing that or something like that. And by our definition, yeah. So even if, even if your psychoanalyst would say, yeah, that's real, but only because these defensive processes block you from understanding what's really underlying your behavior, we say, yeah, but it's still real, because you did on the outside what you felt on the inside, even though there was a social cost. Right, so it's the, it's the real but, but, you, but you're right, it could be that we're then sort of eliminating a, an important piece of the construct space in order to be able to, have, to, to get some traction in measurement. It's always kind of a challenge in psychological assessment. Yeah, this is a good question. You know, initially when I started this work, I was 
I was training students, I mentioned. And actually, there was just a meta-analysis this morning showing that one of those measures, the real relationship inventory, um, I think the meta-analytic effect was like 0.3 with psychotherapy outcome and 0.25 with alliance or something like that. So that was kind of the idea is um, if we could select people or if we could train people, so to use it as an outcome and see whether that was tracking with alliance, which is our sense of what would happen. Now, I don't work in psychotherapy anymore, and I don't work in that clinic anymore, so maybe I should give it to you guys, and you could measure leaders and figure out whether realness matters or not. Yeah. Or short-term versus long-term. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm interested in a clinic situation where I can well, in the work context, where there's some jobs where being authentic might be a good thing versus totally. a bad thing. Totally. And also, the sorts of situational characteristics that might bring out um, authenticity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so part of the way we were thinking about realness is that I think the problem has been that people who develop measures of it, the ones that I reviewed anyway, think of it as a sort of universally positive attribute. And what we were sort of thinking is it's not always a great thing to be that way, and that's why people sometimes don't do it. Like, there's a reason why people don't do it. If you're interacting with a person who has a lot more power than you, it's not a good idea to insult them, for example, right? So it's easier for a leader than an employee, I would imagine, to be real. Um, so those are the kinds of situations I would imagine. There's still probably going to be individual differences within each of those groups, and that's what we're trying to get at. But certainly strong situations are going to make it very unlikely. You know, when an undergraduate comes into my office and says, I'm thinking about going to graduate school, and the end of this meeting is going to be, can you write me a letter? They're not going to say, and by the way, I hated your class or whatever. It's just not going to happen no matter what they felt, right? Whereas that's why we do anonymous teacher evals, right? So that they do have an ability to say that if that's the way that they felt about my class. So. Yeah. Just following up, there, I wonder if there are people who would appreciate that. There might be professors who would totally. actually who would actually go, "This is really showing me what you got." Yeah, yeah. There's a difference there. That's true. There's this interpersonal dynamic here as well. I, I like to think that I would be one of those, although maybe I'm the wrong person to ask that question of. Um, Certainly, I think a lot of us value getting mixed and negative feedback if we're sort of growth oriented. But I think if you're on the other side of that table, the risk doesn't outweigh the potential reward for most people. Yeah. But that's probably been a pathway for some people to get ahead, is to take that risk and get noticed by just the right people and get promoted fairly quickly. It's my guess is that, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the course of a typical interaction, Yeah, I would think, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define that, but I would think of sincerity as being affectively real, to sort of sharing the way that you feel with somebody else in a way that wasn't, there was no subterfuge involved. Yeah, yeah, you just refined, you remember Sartre's definition of sincerity? What's that? The mark of a person who's taken in by his own mask. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it's, it's, so it's a, sort of hedonistic or egotistical in, in a way to be because you have to assume that somebody else cares what's going on inside of you, I suppose, in order to be real. Yeah. And yet, our informants seem to value that in other people. Yeah. It's also just a trait that wants to share, too. But I think it's interesting you say that the informants seem to find it valuable, but I think emotional intelligence and, and how that applies in the workplace. Like you said, like in some, some situations, it's better not to be honest or truthful. Or totally. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly times, there's a time and a place. I mean, part the way we think about it is it's about calibration. So it's not always good to be real. It's not always good to be otherwise. It's about knowing the right time. So it, it, doing psychotherapy, for example, you don't just hit people over the head if they're not ready for it. On the other hand, you don't hold back if you think they can take it. And the question really for effective psychotherapy is how to know when and where and how to intervene. Yeah. So maybe the next question is the individual differences in the ability to calibrate. This is a hard one to get uh, measurement around, but that would be a great thing to be able to measure, he said. And, and emotional intelligence is probably a broad construct that's trying to do something along those lines. But to measure it dynamically, I think, would be really interesting. Yeah. Should we switch? These are two real people. <laughs> We're at 29% battery. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so uh, our 
speaker today is uh, Vishka Blydorn from, uh, uh, well, uh, from UC Davis as well. <laughs> uh, she received her PhD from Bielefeld University in Germany. Um, she uh, worked at the University of Tilburg before um, becoming a professor at UC Davis and is currently an associate professor of psychology at UC Davis. She does work on the conditions, mechanisms, and consequences of personality change. She's widely considered one of the world's leading experts on the topic of personality change, although she's not going to be speaking about that today. She's going to be speaking about the healthy personality. <laughs> uh, she has an age index of 26, which is higher than mine, and um, has also won numerous awards, um, including the Early Career Award for the Association of Research and Personality, the Early Achievement Award um, from the Association European Association of Personality Psychology, the SPSB Sage Young Scholar Award, and the APS Rising Star Award. Um, basically, she's won every award that I've won, <laughs> plus others, and faster than I've won them. She's way better than me, so. <laughs> so we're really it was a race. She's a currently <laughs> an associate editor at the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and at the so at Social Psychological and Personality Science, which are both um, really top journals in, in her field. She has also, like Chris, uh, received numerous grants, uh, in her case from the John Templeton Foundation, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, and the National Institute of Health. Please join me <laughs> in joining Vika. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, it was a tough competition with Ryan. I'm glad he left academia. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm talking about the healthy personality, so we are doing the humanistic psychology spiel today. And it's interesting because we both pre present topics that are not really our pet topics, but we, we became kind of interested in, after having tenure, you're like, okay, now I do something different. And um, it's not completely unrelated to my work in personality development in which I over and over and over again found that most people become actually more healthy, the meaning more healthy in a psychological sense. Like um, almost all normative development is in a positive direction. People become more emotionally stable, have more self-esteem, are less agreeable, more conscientious in uh, middle adulthood, let's say compared to young adulthood. And so we uh, think a lot about the healthy or the mature personality and obviously we were not the first ones and so uh, we used an opportunity and looked back a little bit and looked at others who have um, wrestled with that question. And that's um, Gordon Alport, like godfather of the trait approach. And he used a bunch of traits to describe the mature personality. And he said the mature personality is open to ideas, is warm, self-accepting, is emotionally secure, realistic, responsible, industrious, and direct. And so he was not the only one who has dealt with that question. The psychoanalyst had something to say, and Erickson famously claimed, it's not exactly clear whether Freud has actually said it, but Erickson said, Freud said, um, the healthy person, uh, personality is able to love and work. And maybe the approach that has been mostly uh, associated with healthy, self-actualized personalities is the humanistic approach. And, uh, this gentleman here, Abraham Maslow or Carl Rogers, described the healthy personality as especially self-accepting, spontaneous, autonomous, socially interested, moral, funny, and creative. And I could go on, um, obviously, and maybe describe a few more historical accounts, but the key here is that these obviously different perspectives on individual differences really um, had some common grounds. The first is that they said healthy functioning can be described as a specific personality prototype. That means there might be different ways in which people can be healthy, but there's one particular prototype that is really prototypic of someone who's mature and psychologically adjusted. And the second thing they agreed upon is this prototype can be described as a profile of certain personality characteristics. And overall, these um, approaches agreed that um, the healthy personality is one that has more positive than negative emotion, that is warm interpersonally, uh, is rational and has some sort of self-insight, 
is personal responsible and uh, achievement oriented, has some sort of creative openness, and oh, sorry, I'm going ahead. It has some sort of creative openness. Okay. So um, after the humanists has, uh, have dealt with that question, the topic uh, wasn't really much in the uh, like attention of psychological science for quite a while, actually. And uh, recently, it has made a comeback, and people have named it positive psychology. There's a big movement. Marty Seligman is one of the people who really um, was an important leader in that uh, field and has said, well, we are really interested in character strengths. We have focused way too much on disorders and problematic traits, and it's time to look at the at growth uh, and uh, the things that make us healthy and mature. Now, that's all interesting, but what is also interesting is that personality science has not really picked it up. And there's very little research that has connected these approaches with modern contemporary trait models. And so the question that um, I'm going to ask today and that we looked at in this research is, what is the five-factor model profile of the psychologically healthy personality? And um, we used an approach to address this question that has been used by uh, Don Lynham and uh, Tom Whittaker to describe personality disorders. So that's maybe a little odd to think about. These people have used expert ratings, and I'm not sure maybe you used that too, actually. You are experts in your field to describe um, major personality disorders listed in the DSM. So they gathered a bunch of clinical psychologists, used the five-factor model profile, and asked, for example, describe the five-factor model profile of a person with a borderline personality disorder. And so we used this approach, and we also uh, gathered uh, experts. We uh, sent requests to the SPSP and SPA listservs. These are big societies in our field, and we got experts in personality assessment, clinical psychology, and personality psychology, 137. And the only thing we sent them was like, hey, please describe your idea of the psychologically healthy individual. So a fairly vague prompt. And we said to them, use the 30 facets of the NEO-PIR. And I think you're all familiar with that model, but um, Here's a brief overview of the 30 facets of that model. Obviously, the big five are familiar to you. And maybe you want to pick, pick a couple of traits you think uh, the experts thought or you think are particularly characteristic of a healthy personality. You think about it. So that's what we've sent them, and we got the data back. And um, before we even looked at the profile, we wanted to know, because we gave them this fairly wake prompt, um, what is, this, what is the agreement among these 100, 137 raters? Is everyone thinking the healthy personality means something different, or do we find some agreement? And we use the RWG as an agreement measure. This is an agreement measure uh, we use because uh, we have one particular target and a group of people who measure that. Maybe you're familiar with that. And what it does is it compares the variance among the ratings of these experts to the variance that would have been there sh would have been these ratings completely random. So what you get is basically a reduction in error variance here. So, so you subtract at minus one, and there have been some rules of thumb concerning the interpretation. If you get uh, a value of 0.50 to 0.70, you can say there's a moderate interrater agreement, 70 to 90 is strong, and 0.90 to one is very strong. And to give you a benchmark, maybe even more, uh, Whittaker and Lynham in their personality disorders um, with the clinical experts uh, found an average interrater agreement of 0.70, so pretty strong. And here's what we found. Um, across all the 30 fa facets, we found an average rater agreement of 0.85, and the minimum was 0.78, and the maximum was 0.90. So these 140 um, experts or so had a very similar idea of what a healthy personality would look like. Did they, did they rank the facets or did they uh, oh, yes. 
They had uh, a Likert scale approach. So they said for each facet, say how characteristic or uncharacteristic is this facet for a healthy person. So we could therefore uh, compute an iterator agreement for each facet. Um, so, and yeah, that's the profile that we found. It's probably not shocking to you um, that we will see a little more later that people think like uh, healthy personalities are low on eroticism, emotionally stable. So this is sort of the midpoint of the scale and relatively high on all other traits. And here are the top five rated traits. And you see here like openness to feelings was the highest rated traits. And if you're familiar with the uh, five factor model a little bit, openness is never the most important thing in anything. But for a healthy personality, a mature personality in this sense, it turns out that expressing your emotions and being able to also to appreciate and experience other people's emotions was considered the most important facet for the healthy personality. Followed by warmth, positive emotions, and straightforwardness somewhat related to being real and competence, actually. Okay, so that was a good start, but then we thought, okay, if we wanna publish this, we have to have some positive psychologists in here because they will probably not be happy if we don't ask them. Oh, I should tell you first about the lowest five traits, but that's kind of self-explaining. It's basically all the eroticism traits. That's, um, and the, the uh, one that is really the most characteristic is being low on angry hostility. So not being angry and focusing on the angry part. Okay, but now to the positive psychologists. We wanted to know what they think. So we asked people in personality assessment mostly, but then we went out and asked 77 self-identified experts in positive psychology. We again found strong inter-rater agreement among these people, but more importantly, their profile, the one that they generated, correlated 0.99, a profile correlation with the one generated by our, our experts. Okay, then we thought maybe we should also have some non-psychologists on board and we asked what the students think that's uh, important to us and, and also an easy accessible group. So we asked two samples of undergrad students, a total sample size of 516. We again found relatively strong in a radar agreement, a little lower than among the experts. And we found the profile correlations again to be high, somewhat lower than between the positive psychologists and the personality experts. But the reason really was when we looked at the profile that students think being excitement seeking and high on gregariousness, like um, going out and partying is an indicator of being healthy. And so that was really the only big difference here that ex extroversion was considered healthy among students. Okay, um, what we then did was because we had these uh, expert rating profiles of personality disorders generated by Don Line and colleagues, we wanted to see what the correlations are with these profiles. And here you see the um, correlations between the healthy personality profile generated by our experts and the uh, 11 major personality disorders. And what's really interesting here is that borderline personality shows the strongest negative correlation with the healthy personality. And that's interesting because in uh, recent years there has been, um, well, research and, and several people saying that borderline personality is really like the G factor of personality psycho uh, uh, psychopathology. It really is the, like it captures being unhealthy and sort of being between, right? Being like neurotic, but also angry. Do you guys know that borderline is the same thing as the excitable scale on the GPS? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that would be a, an interesting thing to look at actually, to look at the scales on that. What is also interesting is uh, actually with being a, um, like a compulsive personality disorder, the correlation is, well, not really existing, but it's not even negative. So there is some nuance to these um, uh, associations here. Okay, so overall we found like uh, we can actually describe healthy functioning with a high level of agreement with a basic trait model. 
And in our model, we found that openness to feelings matters, positive emotions, straightforwardness, and basically being low on eroticism. And I want to say we picked the big five model because it's kind of handy, but I'm not saying that this is it. You can use also different models, obviously, to describe the healthy personality. I think that would prob probably work equally well. But what we wanted to know then is also, does this model, right now we've only looked at it from an expert's personality, really um, capture psychological health at the individual level? So can we use this as a measure of health when we apply it to individual people? Uh, we tested that actually by computing a healthy personality index. So we had data of seven samples, so total sa sample size of more than 3,000 people, self and other peer reports. And in all these samples, participants completed either the NEO-PIR or the IPIP120, which is also a NEO-like uh, measure. And what we did is for each individual, we computed the intra-class Q correlation between their, <coughs> their individual personality profile and our expert-generated healthy profile. And what it does, it gives you a sort of prototypicality index. How prototypical or close is your own personality to this healthy personality, or how distant is it? And the intra-class coefficient captures shape and also elevation. So, um, yeah. And so uh, what we did is then we Fisher Z transformed the prototypicality index and used this as a healthy personality index. So we have one score for each person not the whole profile, just to say like, this is how healthy you are, and the higher the score, the healthier the person. And then we looked at all kinds of psychometric uh, uh, statistics, reliability, heritability, and validity, and that's what we found. We found that the two-week test retest reliability is high, 0.80 in a sample of 185. We looked at self-peer report agreement, that's also really high, 0.48, that's what we typically found for domain scales in a sample of 840 uh, participants. We found uh, that it is uh, highly stable. The five-year rank order stability is 0.80. We found that in a twin sample that it's heritable. Everything is heritable. It's not shocking to you, probably, uh, in that regard. But it shows the same characteristic. The important thing is you can treat this index like a trait, basically. It's, a, it's like showing that it works like a measure. And of course, we wanted to know like how does it relate to criteria in like these samples, and we found that it's particularly strong correlated with self-esteem, core self-evaluations, optimism, self-concept clarity, to somewhat lesser degree with uh, planful competence, and it's strongly correlated with self-control. Um, here are some uh, uh, negative correlations with measures of aggression, particularly with uh, overall aggression, anger, and hostility. It's not surprising since that was one of our most characteristic traits here. Um, and we also looked at psychopathy. And here we found some interesting, um, uh, well, nuances. Uh, psychopathy is often described as a like uh, tri uh, triarchic trait. So it can be described as being mean, as being disinhibited, but also as being particularly bold and emotionally stable so to say, and so it was actually correlated with the boldness, uh, positively correlated with the bold part of it, but negatively correlated with meanness and disinhibition. Um, okay, so this is interesting, suggesting that we can use this index as an indicator of psychological health, but now you might say, well, you showed me this profile, that looks uh, a lot like a normative personality profile. Isn't it just like what everyone else is? Isn't like, is everyone low on neuroticism basically, on average? And so, um, the battery is low, so I'm trying to be fast. <laughs> um, we looked, uh, we, com uh, com uh, we put all the data together, four samples, had 2,000 participants, and looked at their average uh, five-factor model profile. Uh, we used this as a norm, as a normative profile, and then looked at the profile correlation with the healthy personality profile. And yes, indeed, the healthy personality profile is very close, 0.80, correlated with the normal personality profile. And here you see the two profiles. So the normal or normative profile is blue, and the orange is the healthy personality profile that is expert-generated. 
And it's very similar. What is different is that the healthy personality profile has certainly more extreme scores, is lower on neuroticism than the average person. And there are some interesting, between, interesting differences between specific facets. For example, activity is considered more healthy than the average person apparently is. And there are other differences at like the facet, the pattern level. But overall, it seems like most people actually are pretty healthy. And that sort of goes together or back to my finding and, and my findings in personality development that most people become sort of healthy with age. So overall, we found that a healthy personality can be described with a high level of agreement in terms of the five-factor model. Um, and we find a, a, a picture that is very similar to Carl Rogers' portrayal of the fully functioning person as being emotionally stable, fairly resilient to stress, capable to experience and ex uh, express, express emotions, um, being warm and friendly, and overall also straightforward and genuine or real. Um, I've got to say it's related, but there's, uh, to the normative profile, it's also distinct. And it, it would be interesting to look more into this, maybe also from a developmental perspective. And so what is the future like? Well, in the future, maybe it would be interesting to use this um, healthy index as a uh, heuristic, uh, at least to capture psychological health at the individual level. And uh, instead of complex profile correlations, you could use a simple count approach, just have the 10 most characteristic traits and uh, look at your profile and add up your scores on these traits to get an indicator of uh, psychological health. And we thought about it before we came here that uh, when, we, when, we, when we decided what we want to talk about that I thought these people must have thought about it or think about this all the time when they try to describe, for example, the leader personality, right? That's something that uh, is occupying your minds, and I thought you have probably uh, very similar approaches and maybe interesting thoughts about it, too. Thank you very much. Uh, this paper just got accepted last week, and, and if you want to read it, there's a preprint also up. There's a link to it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. That's uh, always the question now, yeah. Um, I have no idea. We didn't look, political orientation is an interesting, would be an interesting uh, criterion here. Um, my, from all I know, is, uh, uh, the biggest difference seems to be openness to experience, right, yeah, between yeah. these two, that openness to feelings to the degree that it matters, might matter here too. <laughs> I think that is a really good question. So that's something we should do probably because realness, um, the, the questions that Chris raised, like is it always good to be real, right? Is the healthy personality necessarily real or not? That's sort of an open uh, question. It's like given the emphasis on straightforwardness, we would expect that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's the next expert rating study. Please describe the successful personality. <laughs> <laughs> These were self-reports. We also have other reports. We, I only presented a few uh, here. We, for example, looked at life satisfaction and subjective well-being and had self and other reports. And um, there was a little bit of a method effect in there, but the correlations were still substantial and uh, ranged for the peer self-report comparisons in the 0.30 degree. So other people seem to see the healthiness too. Yeah. 
Yes. Which kind of reminds me of, in a fast route, whatever, this, the big one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like, the big one. I think you raise a really good point in, to the degree. Uh, also, wh- what I mentioned in the beginning, there's probably not only one way to be healthy, right? And um, people find ways to be healthy. And even if they are not healthy in the absolute sense, people are pretty good in finding niches. So I'm, uh, my training is in behavioral geneticism, and I'm really interested in person environment, transactions, or what we call like gene environment interaction and correlation. And people find themselves in settings that really suit their personality. It took Ryan a long time, but he finally made it to Hogan assessment, and it <laughs> seems to really suit him. And so people are really good in finding the, a niche. And so even if you are not average on this healthy personality, doesn't mean that you're unhappy necessarily, right? That's, that's something I think I'm, um, this is a fairly descriptive approach, and you raise such an important point that that's more to that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you think that unhealthy personalities have a chance at becoming more healthy? Um, I think, yeah, that's uh, also interesting because I think b- what most people have to do in their 20s is just to have to wait it out, go through college, and things seem to become better over time. There seem to be some intrinsic maturation probably going on in addition to um, societal effects kicking in. So that's also interesting when looking at these student samples who describe the healthy personality as party time and being extroverted. That's pr- probably healthy in their age group, right? So yeah. And I do also uh, think that there's probably su- to some degree uh, change is possible. I mean, uh, Chris does psychotherapy and uh, with hard work, people can probably work on their traits. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. It probably is also uh, d- dependent on the on the uh, opp- opportunities and options you have, right? When you are stuck in a situation that you cannot change, it would probably be better if you change yourself. But if you have options and can can make your situation work for you, that's probably the easier way to do it. Mm-hmm. There's certainly reputation effects going on, and certain things might, might happen at the self-concept level also, maybe, where you think, like, that's me now, that's my identity that I'm uh, displaying. And it's, re- it's really difficult to tease apart, right, um, what is what to get at the actual traits, yeah, but especially the self importance
Yeah, I don't know. If I don't even. I don't even think I need to have more. So I didn't aspire or, or to say like there's more to it necessarily. It's really a fairly descriptive approach, and I think you can do that. And you are probably left with openness and agreeableness and conscientiousness, which still prob probably gives you some information. But it is also if you if you parcel that out, you take out really valid informative variants. So I wouldn't necessarily want to do it. It just makes it harder. You are right to really say what's important here. Mm -hmm. Christopher Harper. So be before I came, I looked at your at the HPI scales a little more closely with this question in mind at the um, Higgs, um, and yeah, that's where it was. And um, I always forget. <laughs> 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 and that instrument has actually much more healthiness built in already. So the facets, right, are or unhealthiness, you could say. There's uh, there's a little bit more to work with actually if you would if you have if we would have used the hpi we would have probably found a little more nuance in it other than this thank you <laughs> okay i think we should stop here then okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.